Well, folks, it's the day before free agency and Canucks news keeps on pouring in. And I'm a little late to this one, had a meeting, but we do have confirmation that Connor Garland, who is just a part of that big Oliver ekman Larson trade, uh, and Louis Erickson and Jay Beagle and all and Antoine Roussel and everything, and the ninth overall pick, uh, all included on that. But Connor Garland getting signed by the Vancouver Canucks and getting signed before Elias Pettersson and Quinn Hughes get extended. Uh, but as an RFA, uh, was open to offer sheets as of tomorrow, even though we know that those don't really happen. Uh, but he is getting five years at $4.95 million. Now, when Garland was traded for, lots of people were thinking, eh, three years at about $4 million or so was sort of the estimate with the cap. But with Garland being 25 years old, uh, the Canucks decided to buy some UFA years, right? So the way most contracts work in the NHL is once you're an RFA until you're about 27 years old, uh, Connor Garland had uh, about two more years left of RFA status. So those are usually cheaper years to buy because the player doesn't have a ton of rights. Um, but when they hit the age of 27, they're an unrestricted free agent. They basically, instead of having one team bidding for them, they can have 32 teams bidding for them. And that drives the price of a bit. So the Canucks went through and they said, we're going to buy more of those UFA years, which will cost more up front, but it might make those years down the line a little bit cheaper. Instead of going like three years at $4 million. And, and then after that, you might have to pay him seven, six or seven, depending on how he does. The Canucks say, look, let's lock him in now. Might be a slight overpay now, but in the long run, will save us some money. So the way this deal ends up working five years at $4.95 million. Lots of people are saying it's high because they got excited about the $4 million proposition, but the extra couple of years, the five years should be what's really exciting for the Vancouver Canucks. Because you look at this, he's 25 years old. Uh, last year for the Arizona Coyotes in the shortened season, he played 49 of the 56 games. He had 12 goals, 27 assists. He had 39 points in 49 games. And he was really like the only offensive play driver on the Arizona Coyotes last year. And he looks like a really excellent player. I said it when I made my video about how I didn't really like the trade. I love Car Connor Garland. Like he was the huge upside of that trade for me. Uh, and he is the only way that that trade ends up being, uh, that the trade end up, could end up being valuable for the Canucks in the long run is if Connor Garland really, really continues this upward trend that he's had. So 39 games or 39 points in 49 games is a 65 point pace last year that is a lot of that's like that's such that's so much value right 65 points in the nhl is like mid to high end first line caliber player and the canucks are getting that for the next five years especially if you can keep that up the year before 39 points in 68 games so maybe like a 45 50 point pace uh, which isn't as good but he clearly got better last year uh more of a playmaker uh and really uh was excellent now i talk quite a bit about analytics uh, on my channel uh, and there's a lot of people who watch and they don't like the analytics side and, and that was clearly that was clearly let known uh, when I was talking about how I don't think Oliver Ekman Larson uh, is going to be the defenseman that lots of people think they will be because when you look at the analytics he's really not good you know who really likes the analytics or you know who the analytics really like Connor Garland I'm pulling up this from Dom Lucision uh, you'll see this on both sides of my face the one on this side is his projected basically wins added uh timeline and what adds on to this is salary projections basically market value right uh if you're a replacement level player basically if you're like very mediocre and you don't really add a lot to a team you don't drive any wins for the team you're worth about a million and a half bucks but if you drive value compare this to other players in the nhl and and you can sort of try to assign a dollar value to that and if i make this a little bigger we can see the market value on the uh in the bottom side here on the bottom this year projected, he is projected to be worth $7.8 million of salary. Now, if the Canucks are paying him just under $5 million and he can produce that 65 points and it actually be worth almost $8 million, that's huge for the Vancouver Canucks. And we see this throughout the course of this contract. This projection as he age curves, right? Uh, sort of entering the his late 20s throughout the course of this contract. He, he, the, they're out of the contract by the time he's 30. Uh, 6.8, 6.1, 7.4, all these estimates right around the six to seven million dollar mark, which is great value for the Canucks because if he can actually be that, that's what that's how 
basically being in a, in a salary cap based league works, right? If you can get the most value out of your salary cap, you will make the best team. And that's what the 2011 team was very good at. They had a structure that Mike Gillis put together that basically said, look, this is how much we can pay each position. This is what we'll do. And it worked pretty well. Now I'll hide this side of it and we'll look just on this side. Um, the top is what I really care about. Uh, it shows his on ice value and his market value. His market value over the course of his contract is about $34.4 I think that's over about seven years, but over the on a yearly basis, $6.9 million per year of market value for Connor Garland. So the Canucks are basically getting a surplus of $2 million a year of value if he lives up to his projected potential as per this model uh, on the analytics. So if I'm the Canucks, I think this is a good move. Now, the thing is, this move doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? This move also includes the fact that the Canucks really don't have much salary cap. Buying out Braden Holpe this morning, which I made a previous video on, which is probably in your recommended if you haven't watched it already, um, that money is basically more than that. Double that is now tied up in Connor Garland. So the Canucks are down to uh, not a lot of money. Let's see if I can pull up the cap friendly really quick here. Um, but the Canucks are basically at about $20 million in cap space. And with that, they have to sign Elias Pettersson, Quinn Hughes, a backup goalie, and Jason Dickinson, and Ole Uolevi. Uolevi probably will have a contract you can 100% bury, so I'm not too worried about that. But if Dickinson gets around the $3 million range, Pettersson and Hughes maybe around the $14 million range combined, suddenly you're the Canucks with about $3 million left of space to sign a backup goalie, and fill out the rest of your roster. So this leads to me to believe the Canucks aren't done here. Uh, I think Nate Schmidt is going to be the next domino to fall. Uh, just because he makes, you know, five point, or he makes $6 million basically this year, right? $5.95 million. Uh, the Canucks just don't really have the room to keep him aboard um, because they don't have enough defensemen to basically ice a team in the NHL this year. So we'll see what the next domino to fall is, but Connor Garland, I like the signing. I love the player. And, uh, I think Connor Garland's going to be a player that we all really come to love in this market. And I mean, come on, this top nine, this top six, especially is excellent. It's the defense where things get iffy, where you really just have Ekman Larson, Myers, Schmidt and Rathbone, and then Hughes and Yule Levy. It's, it's a bit of a mess back on defense, but the top six of having that lotto line on your first line, Patterson, Besser, Miller, one of the best lines in the league. Uh, I'm not saying it's like top five or top 10, but it's a very good first line. And on the second line, I sort of mentioned this on Canucks After Dark, you basically have five first line caliber players. Patterson is a first line center. JT Miller is a first line player. Brock Besser is a first line player. Bo Horvat is maybe like a low end first line center. Uh, or a high-end second-line center, but at the end of the day, he could get away with being on a team's top line. And Connor Garland, 65-point pace, looking at, like, the worst first-line wingers in the NHL are around 50-55 points. So if you have a guy who can put up 60-65 points on your second line, you are laughing. Uh, and uh, I'm so excited to see Connor Garland in a Canucks uniform. Anyways, obviously lots more news is going to drop over the next day or two. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel uh, if you want more from me and uh, we'll see you next time.